The Mama Take Heart podcast with Rebrina Rettel is brought to you by Life Audio and is a part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational, faith-affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. Welcome to Mama Take Heart, Understanding Your Gen Z Girl. I'm your host, Fabrina Rettel, and I'm here to help you be the gospel-centered, compassionate, and influential voice in your girl's life. Today, my guest is Sandia Oaks. She's a campus ministry leader, speaker, writer, and advocate. Born in India and adopted as a transracial adoptee in the Midwest, she has been serving with Crew Campus Ministry for more than 13 years and loves developing students and staff while watching Jesus set women free. She is the co-founder of The Adoption Triad, a social media group that provides community and resources to those connected to adoption and foster care. Because of her joy for storytelling and love for walking with people through the mountains and valleys of life, she is pursuing a certificate in narrative-focused trauma care through the Allender Center, based in Seattle. Her story holds tremendous loss, abundant resilience, and defiant hope. She is passionate about sharing God's restoration in her journey and has been delighted to do so by writing blogs, being interviewed on podcasts such as this one, and speaking and emceeing at conferences across the nation. She appeared on the TEDx stage most recently as she shared her story, Awakening to My Name. Sandia recently moved to Colorado and spends her free time camping, sipping coffee with friends, and creating tasty charcuterie boards. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today, Sandia. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here with you. Well, uh, first, I just wonder if you can define the term transracial adoption for those who aren't familiar with it. So according to Be the Bridge, their adoption guide, transracial adoption refers to a broad range of parent and child racial blending through the legal entity of adoption. My my uh, definition of that is it is a blending of two different cultures into one family. So for example, I was adopted from India into America, into a home where my family's background was German and they were white skinned and it was a white uh, community. And so my Indian and Pakistani background blending with theirs makes me a transracial adoptee. As you kind of started telling us about your experience being adopted into a ethnic German, uh, white complexion uh, family in the Midwest, uh, why don't you share the rest of your story with us? I mean, my story is is big and um, I wanna just start off by just saying like, I was, yeah, adoption is complex. There, it's not easy and there's many different views to adoption. And for me being adopted from India and being so disconnected from my culture and then being placed in a, a home of just only white people in a white community in a white school, that was really uh, unique for me and hard for me as well. And I grew up um, small town. Uh, and I mean, I was always a playful outgoing kid. I uh, loved talking too much in class and all, but um, school was really my safe haven, my place of, of care and attunement because at home there wasn't any of that. Mm. I grew up in a home where there was a lot of trauma, a lot of neglect, a lot of abuse, and all of that was directed at me. And growing up, I, my, my parents, like they just, there was this dis- disconnect with caring for me. And there was a lot of darkness in my home. I mean, I grew up, uh, I lived in a basement, an unfinished basement, um, most of my life. And, um, my parents called me the thing that lived in the basement and in it. And along with that, like I said, there was a lot of other abuse. And so school was my safe place. When I was 13, I was told that when I would turn 18, I would be disowned by my parents and my family because they no longer wanted me. And at that point, they felt like they had to keep me until I was 18. 
And so as they were counting down the years left to, to have me in their home, uh, the fear in me grew of what will happen? Where will I go? How will I survive? And I had this mentality that really kept me alive of the glass half full. And I, I can attribute it to school, to some of the things I heard and the, the life that I experienced there. But also I remember hearing on the radio that no one can make you have a bad day. You, got, you have the choice. And so I chose to have good days, even when home felt so terrible. And I chose to see the glass half full. I chose to have hope. And at this point, I did not have a relationship with Jesus. And faith wasn't a big part of my story at this point in my life. And I grew up going to church, grew up hearing about God, but I hadn't really um, walked it out in my own personal life. Mm. So I turned 18. I was completely disowned by my family. And on my own, I went to college. I got myself through school. And while in college, I had kind of put everything of my past in the suitcase, this imaginary suitcase, locked it up, put it stuffed under my bed. And I was just kind of ready to move forward in life and to have fun and make something of myself. And it wasn't until my senior year of college that I uh, heard the gospel and responded and began a personal relationship. And from there, the trajectory of healing and growing and redemption and restoration started happening. Um, and echoes of that continue to happen throughout my journey now. Wow, that's a true redemption story. When you look back at your adoption family, what do you think would have made you feel loved by them? There is lots of things. And actually, I just want to even name, like, I just heard this quote through the Seattle school um, a couple of weeks ago that parent, um, kids only need parents to show up and be intentional at their best 50% for kids to turn out good, to turn out well. And 50% is, is not much. <laughs> and I would not even say I had that, unfortunately. And so for me, I would have loved to have my parents engage my ethnic identity I would have loved for my parents to foster and nourish the curiosity around where I'm from and what's the story, what's the true story around my adoption. I would have loved to hear that my beautiful skin is, is seen as good and the brownness is good. I would have loved to have attunement. I would have loved to sit with my parents and be close and connected and have them listen to stories, listen to my dreams. Um, ask me questions about my future. Um, I would have loved to enjoy really good family meals where we talked and we laughed. None of that was true of my childhood. Mm. And those things don't take much. They don't take much resources. They take time, intentionality, but I would have felt so loved. And this is pretty real time that I'm going to share this part. I would have loved to hold my parents' hands as a little girl. Mm. That's been coming up in my own story as I've been doing work around my background and my journey. The longing that I have for one of my parents, my mom or my dad, just to grab my hand and to express I'm here. It's very tactile. I'm with you. And I want to hold your hand in a meaningful way. You mentioned having dinner and kind of laughing at mealtime. And um, I, I think about that, like what why is it important to incorporate uh, your adopted child's heritage into family traditions? Why do you feel that that is an important thing to do? When you don't incorporate it, you're either you're not aware that you're not incorporating it, or you want that child to take on your beliefs, your background, your traditions, which there, there's a way of blending. There's a way of honoring both, but it is significant for the child to know who they are, where they're from, and to feel that connection for those who want it. Not everyone wants it, but to offer that connection of this is a part of where you're from. This is a part of who you are. And God has made you in his image. And he has given you a birth culture, a first culture with a purpose and an intention. And that's part of Imago Dei, of like bringing that image of God here. And so incorporating, whether that's um, 
what you wear, what you eat, what you display in your home. It's saying, I honor all of who my child is and all of their background. It's not just saying, hey, come over to my side and like be a part of just mine. It's a in integration and incorporating. And that is so meaningful, especially as a child, because many adoptees don't do that, don't start integrating till post 18, till yeah. post college, because it hadn't been. And so then they're like wondering, is there a piece of me yet to be discovered? Is there a piece of me that's missing or a longing that's been unidentified or untended to? Well, if you think about it, if uh, a, a person, if you have multiple children, each child is going to have a different personality or a different interest, and you would incorporate whatever your child's interest is into what your family does. So it's kind of interesting how uh, people who adopt um, outside of their own color or race, how they, uh, how it doesn't occur to them to even incorporate that as part of the family dynamic to make it um, normal, to normalize th that you are our child, but yes, we respect and honor where you came from. In that, your story is a redemptive one for sure. One that led you to find love and freedom and identity in Jesus. Um, and so I'd like to know, like, how is God using you and your story to help others? Actually, what, what I'd like to know is how, how did you come to find Jesus first? And then how is he using you and your story to help others? So <laughs> it's a funny story. I signed up. So I'd heard about campus ministry and I had a good friend, Alyssa, who would tell me in, about crew and invite me to the Bible studies, invite me to church, invite me to weekly meetings and so on. And I blew her off all the time. Cause I was like, I don't know if that's really what I want to do. And I was living a pretty kind of wild party life on the side. And so I felt like maybe that wasn't a place for me. And, um, I ended up hearing about the spring break trip to Florida and my senior year of college, I was like, okay, I'm going to go down. And I think it's something like Habitat for Humanity or something like that. So I'm going to sign up, go down. And a lot of my sorority sisters were going down to party and hang out. So I was like, okay, I'll go down, do this whole mission trip thing during the day. And at night go out with people. Well, I sign up, go down there. And I learned that it's not Habitat for Humanity, but it's actually sharing the gospel with people and sowing seeds and um, getting to talk to college students. And once I found that out, I was like, oh no, this is not what I signed up for. I need to get out of here. <laughs> and everyone on the trip kind of knew like that I hadn't yet um, given my life to the Lord. And so they were just amazing. They let me ask questions. Um, they were very non-judgmental and very kind. And I just mm. asked a lot of questions of like, why would you want to sign up for a week to do this? Who is Jesus to you? Why do you act like he's real? Mm. All these things. And the last night of the conference, I sat down with this um, staff guy named Kyle and he answered like two and a half hours of my questions that I just couldn't understand. Mm. And they were pretty hard questions. And he was able to take scripture and help me understand it through the lens of scripture. Um, mm. And at the last moment, I just said, you know, he said to me, why are you so afraid to accept Jesus as your savior and Lord? And I said, honestly, how can I trust God? Someone I can't see who gave me these two families that have hurt me so badly. Mm. And he said, and he had tears in his eyes. And he said, like, God loves you more than any parent will ever love their own child so much that he sent his son to die for you. Mm. And his love is like, unlike anyone else's. And there's a security that you can have in him, unlike any other family on this earth. And those are the things I needed to hear. Mm. And I uh, prayed a simple prayer and just really, really said, Jesus, like, I want to know you and follow you. If you are who you say you are, 
then, then I want to encounter you. Mm. And so I had this really big transformational radical moment of, of a changed life. And as I came back um, from spring break, I got plugged into a Bible study. Um, This woman, Jenna started mentoring me and to help me understand how to read the Bible. And slowly I just got to grow. And honestly, like what was so big for me was that I realized that I didn't know the gospel and I thought, well, how many other people don't know? So I started telling everyone about Jesus. And that next week I saw God move. I saw my roommate come to Christ. I saw two sorority sisters. I saw another baseball player on my floor come to know the Lord. And so I saw movement and I wanted to be a part of that more and more, the more I saw it. So that is how my journey began. And then how's God helping you now? Uh, help others. That's a phenomenal story, by the way. And uh, praise God for that young man that had the patience and the heart. He had a very gentle heart. And then for everyone else who came along, um, alongside you. Yeah, praise God for them. Yeah, Yeah, so I know God's using you now to help others through your story and through your hurts. I would say I've seen God show up in my story and encountering other stories through a variety of ways. And um, one of those is I lead a transracial adoptee Bible study for college women in Minnesota. It's all virtual right now. And I'm getting to use pieces of my story and the ways that God has moved in my, my life through healing, through the gospel, through his power. And I get to help share that with these college women and help shepherd and care for them and bring them to the throne and bring them to the word and help them discover who he is for them in their Mm. lives. Mm. I also am getting to um, lead a group of transracial adoptee parents through a small group that I'm leading on Tuesday nights. And it's uh, I wrote this curriculum for transracial adoptee parents to be able to shepherd and intentionally care for their kids um, as they come into their homes. And I, I love it. I love it. I don't have all the answers and I can speak for sure from my experience and from my research. And these parents are just hungry and wanting to know more of what are the things that they can integrate into their homes and into their families so that all, both them, their kids, their families flourish. And Mm. that's a huge passion of mine. And on the side of that, right now, I am almost finished with my narrative trauma focused care uh, certificate. And my hope with that is I have been engaging with people's stories, um, people from all different backgrounds, adoptees, people of color, women, like just so on. And my hope is to be able to sit with many more people and do narrative trauma work. I want to mm. help them enter into their story. I want to help them see where God shows up and where the enemy has been trying to steal, kill, and destroy. And I want them to know that there's an abundance that is that they have an invitation for. And I want to bring them to the throne. I want to bring them to the Lord through story. And um, because that's what he's done. He's... <sighs> God has worked through my story and he continues to work through my story. And I think the biggest thing is the freedom and the hope are things that people see in me and in my story. And that points to the cross for sure. And so I want them to see that for themselves in their own journeys. I am just so honored that you shared your story with us today. And, you know, I'm praying that, uh, that we have listeners who may have adopted uh, transracially and that this is helpful to them. And um, also, you know, I think your story allows us to see God's redemptive love. It is all through your story. And um, I'm just wondering how can, if our listeners want to connect with you, how can they connect with you? Yeah, there's various ways. So my website is sundayoaks.com. And so you can come there and you can hear a little bit of some other podcasts. You can read some of my blogs and uh, you can even get in touch with me if you're interested in any of the offerings I have. And then you can also follow me on Instagram or Facebook. And so I would love to engage with you, get to know you and um, yeah, hear each other's stories. Now I'll put all the information in the show notes uh, so you can have access to that. And, um, you know, I just um, 
hope that it was very helpful to you. It's a beautiful story to me of uh, God's uh, redemptive love for us. Well, moms, uh, remember God is for you and you're not alone with his spirit. You are filled with courage and strength of purpose. So don't fret, mama. Instead, take heart. Mama Take Heart is a production of Life Audio and the Salem Web Network. If you liked what you just listened to, would you take a second and leave us a rating in your favorite podcast app? It really does help more people like you find our show. This podcast is produced by me, Kelly Givens, and Stephen Sanders, with executive oversight by Stephen McGarvey. You can find more podcasts like this over at lifeaudio.com.